Well, hey folks, listen, I've got six different mid-ranges from MVP and Axiom. They're all 5.5 five or 5.4 five on the front two numbers. They're all almost the same, but they fly tremendously different. So there's a lot to those last two numbers. And we're going to talk about that today to give you a little more clarity to know how these discs are going to fly by looking at their last two numbers. So uh, why don't you join me out on the field and we'll figure it out. Okay, guys, I've got a little quick visual for you that may help you. Hopefully it will. Uh, I'm using a glitch as my example disc because it is a flat flyer. It's supposed to be flat. It's a zero, zero. We're not even going to think about the first two numbers, but we're going to talk about those last two numbers. All right, so what does that mean? Well, a zero and a zero means it's got, it shouldn't have any turn, and it shouldn't really have any fade at the end. So it should be a nice straight flyer. You, you with me so far? The third number means what, how is it going to turn? The high speed turn, the faster you throw it, the more it's going to turn, but we're not getting into that in that vi this video right now. And then the final number is how much, how stable it is or overstable and how much it's going to fade back to the left at the end. Okay. So a zero, zero means you throw it flat and it should fly flat, but let's take and let's put a negative two on that third number here. So now it's a, it's a pretty flippy disc. It's not a super flippy disc, but we know a negative two, if I throw it flat, it's actually gonna wanna turn and it's gonna wanna pop up and start going this way. How do we know how much it's gonna flip? Well, we've really gotta th throw it to get the full idea of what it is, but mentally, if you can follow with me right now, this is the horizon, this is, I'm throwing it flat. A negative two, when you throw it, I like to think it go, it starts to turn, but it goes, here's negative one and here's negative two. That's kind of the angle that it's going to start traveling on. This is not perfect. It's not a perfect science. If you're an engineer or scientist, I know you're going to argue with me. I'm just trying to give people basic ideas of what may be going on. If this disc was a negative three, like the uplink, if I throw it flat, it's going to go one, two, three. That's kind of the angle it's going to take as it goes peeling off to the, to the right. Does that make sense? On the other side of it, let's say we leave the third number as a zero and we make the last number a four, like the deflector. If I throw it flat, it's gonna peel off hard to the left in one, two, three, four. You can basically think about as, as it leaves your hand, it's trying to get to this angle here. And so it's gonna really be fighting to go off to the left because it's dropped down so much. Does that make sense? Uh, let, me, let, me, let me put it a different way. Here's the deal. I've got the uplink and I want to throw straight at the camera, at you. All right? I know that when I throw it, it's going to pop up and turn this way. But what I can do is if it's a negative three, it's going to be about like that when it's trying to travel and turn this way. I can go opposite of that. You got to think about the horizon line. Instead of being like this when it flies, what if I throw it at a positive or an hyzer three? What that means is when it pops up, instead of it turning, it's going to cancel out. It's going to rise up to flat so that it goes from three, and that negative three kicks in, and it pops up and starts flying flat. That's why they call it a hyzer flip. I'm taking an understable disc and I'm throwing it on hyzer and letting its understability pull it from hyzer up to flat. Why is this important? Because a couple things. First, what it allows you to do is it allows you to throw a disc on a more natural angle, especially if you're like you're trying to get in a tunnel or something or trying to throw distance. A lot of times this is a more natural shape of the body to be at a little bit of a hyzer angle. But the second thing is that while it's doing the flip up, it's pushing forward. And so you've got a tunnel, you're throwing it, and it's spending all this time rising up. It's not deviating hard right or left. It's traveling and trying to go straight. This also pays off if you're trying to go around objects and you want to go farther beyond them than just cut behind it. That's why if you've got a basket that's beyond an obstacle and not right behind it, you might not want to throw a fireball or a firebird or a felon or whatever because what's going to happen when you do that, you try to go around the object and it's immediately going to crash back hard right behind the object. 
Whereas if you take, let's say I'm gonna use the uplink for example, it's kind of crazy that you would do it, but you could. If I need to go around an object, I could take it, if I throw it three, I know that it's gonna flatten. But if I throw it a five, if I throw it like this, it's only gonna pop up three spaces, so it's still on hyzer. So what, but what that means is as I release it, it's traveling forward and it's trying to penetrate down the fairway before it fades off to the left. So you can actually still incorporate a hyzer throw into an understable disc. You just have to turn it over even more. Not turn it over, but you have to drop it on hyzer even more to counteract the amount of flip that's going to go on. It's a very helpful thing to understand. And if you can grab it in your mind, you'll be able to use a bunch of different discs in ways you never thought of. Sometimes we're using too stable a disc to make shots that would be better thrown with an understable disc. Now, we can get into all that. You can argue in the comments and stuff like that. But understanding what those two numbers are will help you kind of understand right from the beginning how the disc should fly. Okay, Pete, but what about the combo? Let's say we've got a, a, a destroyer or something like that that's got the first two numbers, 12, 5, or whatever. We won't think about that. But then it's got a negative 1 and then a 2. That's a pretty popular blend. And what that means is I'm going to do it from you. When you throw it, you release it, it's going to start to go out and it's going to flip up to a negative one and it's going to start trailing this way. But then as things start to slow down and the fade takes over, it's going to cut back to a negative three at the end. And so the two join forces and, and impact each other. And depending on the flippiness of the first number, it will impact on how hard it will drop on the end. But so that's why a lot of the discs really like that little bit of turn in the beginning to kind of counteract all of the fade at the end while allowing it to push farther. That's why you see when they're going for big distance, they're always usually turning it over and then letting it cut back. So understanding that the, the turn of the disc on the number three and the fade of the disc on number four, you can already start to piece them in your head if you understand this whole idea of one, two, three, four. It's not perfect, but hopefully it'll help you understand kind of how the disc is supposed to act. And now let's get on the field and see if any of this makes sense. Here's how I have the uh, disc laid out according to their numbers. And so what we've got from left to right is the most stable to the least stable, or hard left to flippy. So now if I throw this deflector right at the basket, it's flat. It just takes off, probably goes out of camera. It's also going to be shorter because you're losing distance as it goes around the corner. If I take the pyro, throw it flat. Not as dramatic, but it's guaranteed to head off to the left. Neutron. Now the neutron has a minus one, so it wants to flip up a little before the two engages, so it's not going to be as dramatic. But that two is going to take over and it's going to head on out. Now the reactor is a minus half and then a 1.5. So it's a tiny flip up and then not as much of a dump off. Tries to hold straight and then the one and a half takes over and it finishes to the left. So the hex is a minus one one. It kind of evens it out. So you throw it, it'll flip up, and then it'll want to fade at the end. If it was a zero, zero, it should just go straight at it. But a one gives it a little bit of wiggle. But pretty straight. And then finally the three is going to want to turn over. And just go off to the right. Now you'll notice that as the stability got less, the disc traveled further. Because that turned over, it carried beyond the basket where the, the hyzers dropped in shorter. More predictable, but shorter. That's one of the things you need to think about. Okay, so when we come to the disc, they should be arrayed like I had them arrayed before. From left to right, the disc could go almost the way I laid, laid them out. So we have the deflector farthest left, then we have the pyro, then we have the matrix 
reactor, hex, and then uplink. So they're, they're following their flight characteristics. So that's kind of how you can start to figure out how they're going to fly according to the numbers. Now the numbers aren't exact. The different types of plastics will make a difference. So you can't just assume that because they've got certain numbers on them, they're going to fly exactly that way, but that's a great starting point. So now we're going to try to counteract the, uh, the stability of the disc to throw straight. So if I want to go straight at that basket, knowing it wants to dump off this way, I'm going to have to throw it at that opposite. I'm going to have to throw it at a minus four angle so that it's going to go out, make that transition, and come back to the basket. So I'm thinking I'm throwing it on that angle. See, I didn't even get it over on the angle enough, and so it carried out. It's such a meat hook, you almost have to throw it like it's a roller. All right, this should be a little bit better. I'm throwing 2.5, so I'm going to throw it up like this. And then it's going to pull out of it, but I'm running straight at the basket. With the matrix, I'm going to give it about something about like that. I turned it over a little bit much so it went to the right of it because remember it's got a little bit of a flip up to begin with so maybe I need to tick it over just a little bit less. Now the reactor straight I'm gonna I'm throwing about like that and you'll get to where you just in, intuitively know how stable the disc is how you need to release it so I'm just gonna <laughs> throw it over to the right and let it come on back to the left at the end. But the hex, straight at the basket. It just wants to ride. And finally, the uplink, I want to go straight, so I'm going to throw the disc on hyzer. So here we go. It pushed to the left. You see, I put too much hyzer on it, so it could only flip up so far before it carried over. But that's good to know. You can figure out, okay, so next time I throw it, if it's a three, and I throw it a three, that should even it out. But if I throw it a four or a five, if I throw down here, even though it flips up to a three, we saw that early, it can't make it all the way up to flat or even over. So I can throw it down here, get it to pop up, but it's still gonna always be on Anheuser. The bonus is that flip up is actually gonna give it more distance and more carry straight forward before it goes left. And that's why these are great, understable discs are great to do a hyzer flip in the woods because you've got a narrower gap and you can flip it up and let it ride straight longer before it finishes up. And so that's what we're going to try to do with this. I'm going to try to hyzer this into the basket. It never left hyzer. It tried to. It got up, hopefully I kept on camera. It went like this, it started to try to flip up and it held out here, held out here, held out here, and then finally came back down to the left. So uh, you can throw a hyzer with a flippy disc, you just gotta put it on more hyzer. Okay, a couple things that are come up, people are gonna say, well, why don't you just throw straight at the basket all the time? Well, obviously, if they're trees or other things, you're gonna need to be able to shape your shots. And so knowing how the disc works is gonna give you a bigger toolbox of shot shapes that you can do. And understanding how they react when you throw the different shots is going to make a big difference. Uh, for instance, even if I have a wide open shot like this, just throwing straight at the basket is good, but my distance and my aim have to be on together. There is actually more room for error if you throw a hyzer that then crashes in because you're not likely to go as far past it or short. You're going to have better distance control. So that's why you often see on any open holes that they can, pros are throwing hyzer shots because it's a more controllable shot that's gonna land in a, in a closer field of missing. If that, the room for error is, is better. So uh, anyway, it's understanding what your disc can do and also understanding the shots. For instance, if I'm trapped in the woods and I don't have a straight shot at the basket but I, and I have to get around a tree to the left, but then there's something guarding the basket over here on the left later on, I know I'm going to need to grab an extra stable disc and put it on edge so that it does the, the flex shot that I can get around this tree and then fight back at the end to get to the basket. 
So I need this disc when I've got to go out and around stuff. However, it takes more, it takes more space. You have to have enough space for it to go out, start to make the turn, come back, and flip back around. So it's like an S that has to spread out to get there. Whereas you can take a flippy disc like the Uplink and I can throw it and it's going to do all its moving in this nice tunnel line. So understanding the, the flippiness, the stability of the disc can allow you to shape the shot but also be a little bit wiser in which shot to use according to the room you have and the obstacles you have to get around. Hope that makes sense. But uh, anyway, I'm going to throw a couple more and uh, then I'll go back to the studio and try to clean all this mess up because it's a mess. This also applies to turnover shots. This one already wants a turnover, so I don't have to do much, but I do know that if I get it wrong, it's going to burn out. So I oftentimes will not throw a very turnover disc for a turnover shot because I actually want it to go out and then start to stable up a little bit so that it lands softly. I've got a little bit of a headwind. Let me see if I can show you right now. I'm just going to throw this on a turnover shot, but I'm going to throw it pretty flat. Wind got it, and see it's coming around. It's got a little bit of stability to it, so it didn't, it didn't turn into a throller, but a little bit less, and it would hit on edge, and it started rolling. So then if I take, let's say, my reactor and throw the same shot, even though there's wind, it's going to fight out of it and start to flatten. But you also notice I got a lot more distance with it. That's great to understand. When you're at a certain place and you need to get around something, but you also then need to push farther, you don't necessarily need to go with the, the, the first thing in your head, oh, I need to throw a flippy disc. No, you might need to throw something a little more stable that's going to get around the corner and then fight out farther. Uh, let me do the neutron reactor. I mean the matrix. It's turning, it's turning. Now it's starting to fade out and look at it just lock, glide. And then finally, I'm not going to throw the deflector because it's just ridiculous for most shots when you're trying to throw farther. But it's a great utility disc. Or if you've got a big arm, you could crush it. All right, so the pyro really wants to fight back. So I've got to make sure I don't get the nose up because if I do, it's just going to burn out, go to the left, and crash. So I've got to get it over, but not too far over that it turns into a roller. But if I get it right, it's going to go up, it's going to catch that turn, and then it's going to start to pan out and it's just going to go. All right, it's starting to turn, but look at it carry. It's just carrying, carrying, carrying. And that's just a beautiful shot. So understanding the stability is really going to help you know how to get the right angles and the right distance. So hope that helps. Back to the studio. Well, it appears I still have some work to do on my field camera work, but I really do hope my ideas come across well enough that you have a better understanding of not only what the last two flight numbers mean, but also how to use them to your advantage. I can remember the practice week before Am Worlds back in Augusta in 1996. I kept coming up short on this long hyzer hole. And I was playing with Dan Marcus, who was the top pro in the area, and he said, why don't you try throwing a flippy disc instead of your stable one? Actually, back then, because we were so old, we really didn't have that terminology, so we just kind of grunted and pointed at each other, but somehow we made it through. I put a little extra hyzer on my flippy disc, it went around the tree, and then kept gliding and made it all the way to the basket. And it really just blew my mind. It was then and there that I understand for the first time how important understanding the flight characteristics of each disc was so that I could throw smarter and not harder. And that is my hope for you. Because you see, I know the pain of knowing that there's an answer to a problem that's just out of reach and not being able to figure it out. My hope is that this video will help remove some of the disconfusion you may have so that you can truly get the most out of this wonderful game. If it does, please do me a favor. Turn around and help someone else who may be struggling. Let's work on this wonderful game together and make it less about competition and more about cooperation. Thank you so much for watching, and I truly hope to see you out on the course.